So yesterday I've explained you uh, basic machinery of heights within Arakalov geometry. I mean, a high notion of height of varieties and uh, uh, using uh, neutralized line models. And uh, the last slide was devoted to a theorem of, of Shou Zhang claiming that for, let's say, a polarized dynamical, dynamical system, the analog of Bogomolov's conjecture is true if and only if the height zero subvarieties are precisely the preperiodic subvarieties. And uh, as I said, this theorem is related to a uh, close interaction between heights of points and heights of subvarieties, which has been uh, established by Shou Zhang, and which I want to show you in the next part. So this is called arithmetic positivity. And before I can uh, discuss arithmetic analog, I have to go back to the geometric one. <laughs> so in the geometric case, we have vibrations of uh, the curve and a line model on the total space of the vibration. Now, what does it mean that, uh, well, the, the analog of the, the relation between heights is the fact that if a section has positive degree, a, se a section of this vibration has positive degree against L, then this is related, so this fact is related to the existence of global sections for the line model of L. Of course, if I have a global section S which does not vanish identically and which does not vanish well, such that the point P, which does not vanish at the point P, then I can, to compute the degree of sigma P with respect to L, I can use the divisor of this section. And since the, se the section sigma P is not contained in this divisor, the, see, the degree is just computing, computed by uh, computing a local intersection multiplicities, and they are positive, but they are non negative because uh, the, the cycle sign. In, a good pro in good position. And so you get uh, the fact that the, the height is not negative. Conversely, uh, but now, now we want to understand the converse. So if the line model is ample, at least on the generic fiber, then the line model or its powers, that is the same for, for the moment, it well, does not change does not make any difference. Then, so the line model will have global sections. And uh, the divisor of, so for the moment, is just global sections. So I have x over b, and I have the generic fiber. And here I have some line model l. And so I'm just talking about section of uh, l on the generic fiber. Such a section as a divisor here. And the divisor extends, I can take the Zariski closure in, in X, and I can, so I can extend the, no, I don't do that. I, uh, I, I look at S as a meromorphic, I don't extend the, I don't take the Zariski closure for it. I, I first uh, consider the section as a meromorphic section of the line model L on the variety curly X, and then I look at this, this divisor, so divisor of the section S and X. So this divisor has, an, uh, has two parts. One is horizontal, which means that it projects onto B, and this, is, this part is the risky closure of D. Can you read here? Uh, yes, no? Okay, so. So you have divisor on X of S as one part is, which is the closure of D, plus some vertical part, meaning that it is contained in fibers. And uh, let's say, assume that uh, the whole fiber is in the divisor of S, appears in the divisor of S with a coefficient D. Then this means that the order of this section will vanish, well, the order of this section with respect to the t-adic valuation 
will be at least D for any point which is not contained in the divisor uh, F, in the divisor of S. And th this inequality is equivalent to the fact that the t-adic norm of the section S <coughs> is smaller than exponential minus D uh, at the point P. So the conclusion is that if uh, the, inequality, the inequality norm of S, the t adic norm of S is at most T, for all T, then the section S will extend to, the, to a global section because it won't, the divisor of S won't have any vertical components. Well, this holds at least if the space is normal because uh, otherwise uh, co-dimensional subvarieties don't detect uh, integrality, but basically it's, this is what happens. So to detect the fact that a generic section, a section on the generic fiber is integral, it means that it has norm smaller than one. Okay, and if it is, if it has no, if it is, it extends to a global section, sorry, I don't know why. So if it extends to a global section, then I will have positivity for height of points outside of the divisor. So I want to do the same in arithmetic geometry. So I let X be a variety of our number field, F. I take a line model together with a metric. And I defined some one space and two numbers. So the first space is just is denoted H naught of X L bar. So this is a space of arithmetic global sections of the line model of the metrized line model L bar. So this is the analog of H naught of curly X L. So I defined this space as a space of global sections of the generic fiber, which have norm at most one at all places. So this is exactly the analog of H naught of curly X B, as I explained in the preceding slide. So now I can, this is a, a finite set, usually, and uh, I will define a small H naught of X L bar to be the logarithm of the cardinality of this set. And so this is the number which I am interested in because I want to find section. If, I want, if I'm interested in the positivity of height of points, I'm interested in such sections which have absolute value, which have, which have norms smaller than one at all places. So I'm really interested in this small H naught. But this number is hard to understand. So a better number, which is well behaved for exact, for exact sequences, in inductions and so on, is this chi of XL bar, which is a kind of, uh, so which is defined uh, as follows. It is, uh, I look at the global section, gam gamma of x, l. So this is a q, well, this is a f vector space, but I, I can tensor it with r. So I get a r vector space. And within this space, I have two objects of different nature. The first one is uh, the ball at real places, or at, at Archimedean places. That means the, the, the set of sections whose, whose norms are smaller than one at all Archimedean places. And the second set is lambda. It's a set of sections who have subnorms smaller than one at all finite places. And I am interested in the intersection of these two sets. So observe that lambda is a lattice in uh, gamma of XL, and that B is a ball, really a ball. Really. So, so in now I'm, you see that I'm the, the, the set I'm interested in is a set of points of a lattice which belong to a given ball, to the unit ball. And so Minkowski's theorem tells you that this set is related to, to some numbers, which is precisely the logarithm of the volume of the ball divided by the covolume of the lattice. And so Minkowski's theorem, just uh, on the bottom of the slide, tells you that this, this H naught is at least the chi of X L, the bar, bar, and you have some error term, which is controlled by the rank of the vector space, the dimension of the vector space, okay? So if I can bound this from below, then I have a lower bound for that, and it maybe it can be of some use. So I want to understand the behavior uh, of such numbers, uh, gamma of x L bar. So, so there is a, if I go back to algebraic geometry, what I'm interested in, this chi is the analog of the direct image of the line model uh, L, L 
on the base B. And so I have a Hilbert Samuel formula which tells me that the degree of P lower star L to the K is approximately uh, one of a factor of N times the degree of uh, X, which sounds, okay, uh, the, the degree of the variety curly X with respect to the line model L times K to the N. At least if the line model L, L is ample, is relatively ample. So this follows from, say, you can prove it uh, from scratch, but you can also prove it using Riemann or and vanishing theorems. So in arithmetic geometry, there is a similar statement, which is due to Gilles Soule, but this, uh, the statement which is on the slide is due to Dong, because I have no assumptions on regularity and things and thing like that. But it's essentially a simple derivation from Gilles Soule's theorem, and it is false because there is a small k missing here. So it says that this number, chi of x L bar, L bar to the k, is as an asymptotic expansion, and the leading term is one over factorial n plus one times C one hat of L bar to the power n plus one against x times k to the n plus one. So this number is precisely the height of the variety x, as the number above is the degree of the variety called x. Okay, so the analogy is there, and the n has been changed to n plus one because in the ge geometric setting, see this curly x was of dimension n, so this means that the generic fiber is of dimension n, mi n minus one, and here I have only the generic fiber, x is a generic fiber in some sense, of some non-existing vibration over some projective arithmetic base. So uh, this theorem has two proof, uh, I won't give, a, I can't, really can't give a proof of that theorem. So uh, there are at least two proofs in the literature. Uh, and maybe some more, but okay, at least two. One is due to Gilles Soule and uses the analog of the riemann roch theorem in Oracle of Geometry, combined with uh, estimates on the analytic torsion due to Bismuth and Vassro. So it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite difficult. And there is a simpler proof which does not use riemann roch and which goes, which tries to, to study directly the space of global sections of subnorm at, at most one which is due to Abbess and Bush. So you have two proofs. One is using riemann roch and in some sense vanishing theorems as you bound, you try to bound cohomology and analytic torsion, which is the analytic analog of cohomology at finite places in that context. And the other uh, more or less follows the classical proof of Hilbert Samuel, Hilbert -Samuel formula. And needs also a, a lot of analytic uh, inputs, but uh, nevertheless it's simpler. So if you combine both theorems, uh, Minkowski and Hilbert Samuel, then you get the following result. Assume that L bar is semi-positive, which is uh, this vertical, uh, an analog of uh, vertical ampleness, and assume that the height of the, the variety X is positive, then you will find a lot, you will find many sections uh, for powers of L bar, which have, uh, when then this number, this number will be big when k goes to infinity. So k will be big, and uh, if k is big, then h naught is big too, because the difference of k and h naught is controlled by the dimension of the space of global section, and this dimension of the space of global section is given by the Hilbert Samuel formula. It's, it's something like uh, k to the n. So this is really the leading term for k and for h naught. So. If the height is positive, then you will find arithmetic global sections. And then you can use these sections to compute the height. Uh, the, the formula is just that uh, if you take a point P, which is not in the divisor of S, then the height is just the sum of minus log of norm of S at all, uh, at all places P. And you will see that this height is non negative. Okay? So this is the simple, uh, the simplest. Uh, well, this is a simple part of this positivity, this relation of heights of points and heights of uh, varieties, which I will use in the equilibrium solution theorem. But uh, there is a harder and converse inequality in the other side, which is also due to Zhang. 
which say that if the height of points is positive, then the height of the variety will be positive. And so the first, the easy side is related to Hilbert Samuel, and the hard side is related to a Nakai Moishetzon theorem in our respective geometry. It, uh, so you, you need a criterion for a line model to be ample in our respective geometry. So now, what one can do, uh, uh, it is unlikely that my given line model will have, uh, will give a positive height to the variety. Let's say, because if I look at a polarized dynamical system, then the height of the variety is zero, as I explained, because it is the variety itself is preperiodic. So the hypothesis that the height is positive is not satisfied in practice, but what I can do is I can rescale the metric. I can multiply the metric by any fixed number, and then uh, I can compute the new, new height of the variety, and, the, and it will, and for, for some values of the scaling, uh, the height will be positive. So for that values of the scaling, I will get positivity of height, and then you can see what, what happens in practice. And so the result you get is, is that if you take an ample line model with a semi-positive metric, and if you take any sequence of points, pk, which is generic in, sim in the sense that it is not, or no, no subsequence is contained in a subvariety, I, I have to avoid uh, any variety which is strictly in advance, then the height of the points, there is some hand which should not be there, the, the, the height of the points pk will be bounded from below, at least in the limit, by the expression on the right hand side, which is the height of the variety x divided by the degree of the variety, and there is a small factor n plus one. So this tells you that if the height is non-negative, then except, if the height of the variety is non-negative, except on some closed subset, the height will be maybe not non-negative, but uh, greater than some, small, some uh, so it will be at least some minus of some epsilon, which is as small as, as you want, okay? And uh, what happens about equidistribution theory when equidistribution theorems come, come, appear is that if you find a sequence of points pk such that you have equality here in this formula, then this sequence will provide you uh, equidistribution, will be equidistributed. So, to explain that, uh, so equidistribution is related to a variational principle in our of geometry. I mean, it means uh, I will study the preceding inequality, not only for the line model L bar with its matrix, but for small deformations of this line model. So, and this equidistribution was first observed by uh, Spiro, Ulmo, and Zhang in their work on, when they worked on Abelian varieties. So there they observed this equidistribution phenomenon, and uh, so their proof well, was maybe only given for varieties, but it was for evident varieties, but it was clear that it's extended to, to something fairly general. And the idea for the proof, though, is to apply, apply Zhang's inequality to small perturbations of the line model L bar. So you pick up a function phi on X, on, on the complex space of X, because you're interested in complex equidistribution. And you denote by L bar of epsilon F, epsilon phi, it's not a f, it's not a phi, it's a f. Uh, the metrized line model, which is obtained from L bar by multiplying the metric by exponential of minus epsilon f of phi. Okay, so it means that if the norm of a section at a point If the norm of a section at the point was norm s of x, at the new point is norm s of x multiplied by exponential minus epsilon phi of x. Just means that. And now you, you can compute how the heights of points and varieties are modified in that modification. So for the height of point, what you get exactly is that the height gets you have a new term to be added, which is epsilon times the sum of the function phi at all conjugates of the point P. And you have to divide by the degree of P. And so what you add is exactly epsilon times the integral of the function phi against this discrete measure, measure delta of P. Because delta of P is just one over degree of P 
times the sum of the Dirac measure at the point PG, PG, uh, right, PG are conjugate. So this is what you get for the height of the point P, and for the height of the variety X, then uh, you can use multilinearity of the height pairing and see, see what happens. So you get the first term. The first term is, of course, the height of X, because when epsilon is zero, then you get the initial metric and you get the height of X. So and the first term is L n plus one times epsilon times the integral over the variety X of C of the function phi integrated against the measure, the, the measure C1 of L bar bin X. You remember that to L bar I had attached, uh, let's say in the elementary, in the, in the case of elementary grain functions, I had to attach a curvature form and then could take the power, maximal power of this curvature form to get a measure. Okay, so this measure appears exactly in that formula, in that. So now what I can do is, uh, take a generic sequence of points, and look what happens. So uh, I will take, I, I'm interested in the distribution of such, such measures here, so delta of say pk. So I will take uh, a, me a measure nu on the variety x of c, which is a limit measures, measure of, which is a limit of those measures. And I will try to see what I can deduce on this measure nu from Zhang's inequality. So first of all, the infimum limit of H of P, PK is just by the formula for the height of points. The infimum limit of the height of PK for the all the line model plus epsilon times the integral of phi against nu. So now what is the infimum limit of the height of PK? By, by, by assumption, it's, it's just the height of x divided by n plus one degree of x, because I assume that the sequence pk was achieving equality in Zhang's inequality. And there is uh, some, uh, and the second term is just a time integral of x of t phi, phi nu. I have re rewritten uh, phi nu, uh, what did I say? Duck, 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 um, no, it's written completely, Not uh, sorry. So I have to. So what I said is the infimum limit h l bar of epsilon phi for pk on one side is uh, equal to uh, infimum limit h l bar of pk plus epsilon integral of phi nu. On the other side, it's at least equal to, by Zhang's inequality, to HL bar of epsilon phi of x divided by n plus one degree of x. So on the denominator, the degree does not change because I've not changed the line models. The line model, I've only changed the metric, so this does not change. And so this is equal to H L bar of x plus n, n plus one epsilon integral of phi c1 of L bar to the power time x plus some error term, which is small, divided by n plus one degree. So now this is at least that, at, this term is at least, at least equal to that. So you see that this and this cancel, and so you get that epsilon times integral of phi nu is at least epsilon times integral of phi against C1 of L bar divided by degree of x. To the power of time x. Okay? So now this is a plus, 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 plus some big O of epsilon Epsilon, epsilon squared. So now I can get epsilon go to zero. And what happens is that this gets at least that. If epsilon goes to zero by using positive values, but if I use negative values, then I get the other inequality. <laughs> so 
the limit. So that is equal to, and this is exactly what I wanted to prove. That is, I have taken a, a measure nu, which is a limit of this sequence of measure, and I've shown that this measure nu is precisely equal to the measure uh, attached to L bar. So now, uh, um, so skip the beginning of the, of the slide. So by compactness of the space of probability measures, uh, there is only one limit value. So, so the, sorry. So the, this sequence of measures delta of pk has only one possible limit value, and by compactness of the space of measures on a compact metrizable space, and this implies that the sequence delta of pk converges to this limit value. Okay, <coughs> but nevertheless, there is some assumption which is necessary for all of that to hold. Is that I needed to use Zong's inequality here for this line model L bar of epsilon, epsilon phi. So here I use Zong's inequality. And for Zong inequality to hold, I need that the line model L bar of epsilon phi, epsilon phi is uh, semi positive, at least if epsilon is small enough. And this was, and this is a, uh, well, this might not look, look so, but this is, this is a very strong assumption. So uh, for abelian varieties, it was satisfied because uh, the, the one one form that one gets in the theory of mere wanted height is exactly the scalar form on the abelian variety attached to the line model L bar, to the line model L. So it is a scalar form, it is strictly positive everywhere. And when I deform it by some uh, epsilon phi, I get something which is still positive. And so the positivity assumptions are satisfied. But uh, for dynamical systems, then this measure mu L bar is precisely the canonical measure mu F. This is what I explained uh, on Wednesday. And uh, Berthelot, Dupont, and Loeb have shown that uh, the positivity of this measure mu F is characteristic of examples coming from abelian varieties. It means really that this measure mu f is very singular. It's not at all likely to have a support, uh, to have a high dimensional, uh, a support which is big. And even if the support is big, it's unlikely to be comparable with uh, Lebesgue measure on, on the support. Uh, unless the dynamical system comes from an abelian variety where you don't need all that because you already know equidistribution by the case of abelian varieties. So, uh, it was a major obstacle to, well, it is a major obstacle to use Zhang's inequality to prove equidistribution for a dynamical system. Anyway, Autissier uh, proved in his thesis in around 2000 that the positivity assumption is not necessary for curves because he could prove an inequality of Hilbert Samuel type without posi uh, any positivity assumption. The fact is that uh, for curves, you have H1, uh, H0, H1, and H2. And the H2 has a positive sign, so which uh, doesn't matter for that work. And the H1, he could, he could control. So, so in that way, you, um, he, he could achieve equality. So this implies that if you take a dynamical system on P1, then you have equidistribution of points of small height to, to, towards the canonical measure mu f. Okay, um, so that was the situation uh, until uh, the beginning of this year. And so uh, in March, uh, Shou Zhang told me that one of his students was able to, had proven a theorem that allows to, not to remove the semi-positivity assumption in Zhang's inequality, but at least to, to circumvent it. So, I go back to algebraic geometry to explain what happens. There is a, what we want to do is to find arithmetic sections of this line model. And this line model is essentially the sum of two line models, well, two metrized line models, that one and that one, which is a trivial line model to equipped with this metric uh, epsilon f. So we want to show that sum of line models have sections. And so proved that if you take two ample line models, L and M, and if you look at the difference of them, 
then the powers of this line bundle of, will have many global sections when m is not too big. I mean, uh, C1, the degree of L, the degree of C1L to the power n, the maximum, po maximum power, has to be greater than n times C1n, C1l, n minus 1. So it means that for small m, a difference of an ample light bundle and another one will still have many global sections, at least if I take powers. So I will still have an inequality. And so uh, the analog is due to so Zhang's student, Yuan. So if you take uh, two line models, L bar and M bar, which are arithmetically ample, I won't know, don't want to define what it means, then the, this chi number of the divisor, the uh, neutralized line model, L bar tends from N bar minus one to the power K, will be at least equal to the, this term, which looks exactly like Sio's second hand. So second, uh, Sio's uh, formula, you see, you have the difference of the height and the difference of uh, minus C1 M bar times C1 L bar to the power N, plus some, so times K to the N plus one, plus some error term, which I won't be. And so this equality allows you to apply these variational principles in general. And uh, so this shows, uh, well, this, this concludes the description of the equidistribution theorem for, let's say, uh, dynamical systems. So take a polarized dynamical system of our number field, F, contained in C, denote by HF and mu F the canonical height and the canonical measure attached to this dynamical system. Take a sequence of points, in, of algebraic points in X of F bar, such that first the height go to zero, and second, uh, no subvariety contains infinitely many points. Then the discrete measures delta of pk converge to the measure mu f. Okay. So, um, so uh, it meant that I've been much quicker than. I expect it to be, and that we'll have the time to explain you periodic equidistribution now without to bother you at five o'clock, so. <laughs> will probably be better uh, to do that now. So now what about uh, periodic equidistribution? So the question is, uh, well, the question you, you might expect, you take a prime number, you complete the number field well, you, you take a, you complete the field Q with respect to the periodic valuation, you take the algebraic closure of that, you get QP bar, which is not complete, but you complete again, you get CP, which is algebraically closed. You take a variety of our number field F, and uh, now, given an algebraic point on X, you still can define a measure, a discrete measure, on the variety, whatever it means, X of CP. At least it's a variety in the sense of uh, in the sense of, well, this notion of soft uh, periodic analytic spaces, well, which we can find the definition in Bourbaki and something like that, which is not very useful in algebraic geometry, but anyway, it does exist. And uh, so you have this topological, topological space, which is uh, analytical, a CP analytic variety. And you, well, you can use measures on that spaces, and you, can, you have discrete measures attached to algebraic points, just by uh, averaging the discrete masses, ma direct masses at all conjugates. Now you take a height function of x, let's say one given by a polarized dynamical system. Real, real valued measures. It is real, this is real, uh, real measure theory, in <laughs> any sense. <laughs> okay, and, and the question what you can ask is what is the periodic limit distribution I think on, on this space? How do the measures uh, behave? And so what I discovered is that if you want to answer that question, you have to introduce Berkovich spaces. So <coughs> Berkovich spaces are a, <coughs> a new kind of analytic spaces in the periodic case. Uh, which, uh, so I have to refer to explain the new. So if you have a variety of a periodic field, 
you can look at its periodic points, and it gives you it gives rise to a periodic analytic variety in the soft sense, which is not interesting for algebraic geometry because it is totally disconnected, so you don't have any Gaga principle and one. So now there have been many. Uh, uh, I say not tentatives, but. Uh, a lot of efforts to define a good notion of periodic analytic spaces where you would have Gaga theorems and comparison between analytic geometry and algebraic geometry. And one of them is due to Tate, uh, which still looks at this topological space, which is totally dis disconnected, but it forgets for a moment this topology and introduces a new topology, which is actually not a gro topology, but a Grothendieck topology, and then in that framework, he is able to to, well, to study these spaces, and there are many important reasons for those rigid spaces, for example, Gaga theorems in the proper case, and so on. But if I, say, I, I believe that it's not possible to do topology on those spaces still. So the spaces that Berkovich introduced uh, contain all these, po these periodic points, but they contain many more points. In some sense, Berkovich added uh, many generic points to uh, this, uh, let's say, uh, naive variety. So uh, these points correspond to uh, multiplicative seminorms on algebras. So in algebraic geometry, points correspond to morphisms for, from algebras, from uh, finite type K algebras, say, so the case of field, to fields. In the Berkovich sense, they correspond to, to morphisms for, from affinoid algebras, which uh, Henry described a bit yesterday, to not only fields, because you want to do analysis, but to valued fields. And so if you have a map from an algebra to a valued field, then you have a seminorm on the field, which is given by uh, taking an element of the algebra, pushing it to the field, and then taking its absolute value there. And it's a seminorm because the map could have a kernel. So these spaces are quite complicated. Uh, for example, if you look at curves, you'll get something like a, a graph. It looks like a graph in some rough sense, but it is very hairy. I mean, uh, I tell you, it's a graph which uh, you have a length on the edges, and at any rational point on the edge, you have some graph which is leaving, and on any rational point on this graph, you have branches that spread out. And so it's very, it's a hairy space in some sense, but. Uh, the topology is good enough so that you can do uh, topo uh, you can do topology or analysis on them. For example, if you take a smooth connected algebraic variety, what you get is locally compact, is path connected, and is locally even locally contractible by a deep theorem of uh, Berkovich himself. So you get spaces that are closer to the, well, the spaces one is used to do analysis with. So I want to describe a bit more, uh, bit, bit more details, the, the unit disk of a CP. So in any theory of analytic functions of a disk, one knows what such a function is. It means it has to be, uh, an analytic function on the disk has to be a whole of uh, uh, power series which converges on the disk. Okay, so the ring, the, the functions on the disk has to be the set of power or formal power series whose coefficients in CP go to zero. Is this it's a closed unit disk, yeah. So, well, there is a, an important feature of periodic analytic spaces, which you can find uh, either uh, in Tate's approach or in Berkovich's approach, or in any approach, that the basic uh, sets you can work with are affinoids, and they look like compact sets, not like uh, open sets. So, so, so you have a map, you have just one uh, No, no, you, you will see, i show you. <laughs> you have many, many more. <laughs> so on this space of analytic functions, I have a norm, which is just the, the maximum of the norms of the coefficients of the analytic function. I take the power series, maximum n. And uh, a theorem of Gauss tells you that this norm is multiplicative. So it's an appropriate way, place to talk about that. So the unit disk is, uh, is defined by m of a. So 
M is a notation of Berkovich. It's a Berkovich spectrum in some sense of A. And it is a set of all multiplicative seminorms which extends the valuation of CP. And, well, you have to say that these, these norms are bounded, but uh, I mean, you only look at norms that are uh, dominated by the norm, the Gauss norm, because otherwise you could get a pathological thing. So classical points of the disk correspond to the seminorm F goes to absolute value of F of Z. If you take Z in the disk, you can evaluate any function F, any addictive function, any function F in A at that point to Z, and then take the absolute value and gives you a multiplicative seminorm. Now you have a, a new point. You have the Gauss point, because I told you that the Gauss norm is multiplicative, so it gives you a new point of this Berkowitz space. And uh, the rest I've said. So you, at least you have the classical points plus one new point. But uh, so to define a topology, when you just say that if you have a function, I'll show you. I'll show you in two seconds. So two minutes. So uh, you you have to define a topology on that on that space of norms, and you, you define the topology uh, as in a theory of Gelfand spectrum and so on. So you ask that if you take a function, then you want to evaluate the the, the various norms of the function mu of f, and you ask that this is continuous on the space of norms. Okay. And so uh, the, the space you get is a compact topological space, and it is also metrizable be because the residual field of CP is countable. So, so c the, the, the affinoid algebra CP of Z, CPZ has a down, uh, countable uh, dense uh, subset. So moreover, the, this space is connected and contractible. And moreover, in that case, you can join any two point by a unique injective path. So the example is the following. I show you a path which will go from the zero point to the Gauss point. And I define mu t to be mu t of a function f, where f is sum of a and z, a and z to the n, to, to be the maximum of absolute value of a n times t n. And this is uh, exactly the supremum of the function f on the disk of center zero in radius t. And this is multiplicative by, still by Gauss theorem. OK, so this gives you a seminorm. And the mapping, from the, the map which assigns mu t to t is continuous, to, to be, because uh, the, this function max of a and t n is continuous. So in that way, you see that I have, I have drawn a path from the point 0. When t equals 0, you get exactly the classical point 0 to the Gauss point when t equals 1. And so now, so this shows you uh, one path. But w why uh, can you, for instance, connect uh, any classical point to any other? Then in periodic analysis, disks have many centers. In fact, any point of the disk is a center of the unit disk. So you can do the same construction uh, by using another center, and then uh, you go from 0 to the Gauss point, and then from the Gauss point to any other center. Sorry? Uh, you know that? Well, you, you can describe it uh, more precisely than you see that it is unique. But uh, it's not. Well, Est-ce que c'est facile de voir que le. Is it easy to see that the path is unique? No, no. That the path linking two points is unique. So this is the case for 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 the unit disk, but it's. Right. Oh, and you, uh, so you have those points. And now you can take a decreasing family of disks. So uh, 
usually if, if the radius of the disk go to zero, then the intersection of the disk will be a, a single point. But if the radius don't go to zero, then two things can happen. Either the intersection is still a disk, or the intersection is empty. Because CP is not a, what is the word? Uh, no, it's not a problem of being locally compact. It's uh, a problem, it's very spherically complete. It's spherically complete. I mean, intersection of disks, an inter a decreasing intersection of disks is not, m might be empty when the radius of the disks doesn't go to zero. So you can check as an exercise in the real numbers, if you, on, in, the, in a real vector space, if you take a decreasing uh, collection of disks, then the intersection is not empty. But in the periodic case, it's, false. it's due to the existence of uh, extension. Uh, well, okay, so, uh, so you have you this decreasing collection of disks uh, whose intersection is empty gives you a new norm because the uh, infimum of all norms, of all set norms. For a disk, yeah, yeah. yeah, but in that disk you have new disks, so you have. In fact, each time you get out one of these strange new points, the space gets uh, totally disconnected. Uh, it gets uh, disconnected into infinitely many components. Sorry. I say that if you say remove the Gauss point from the Berkovich unit disk, oh, the Gauss. then what happens is that you get a countable collection of uh, open unit disks indexed by the residue field of CP. So you have many open disks that are just linked by one point somewhere. So I will uh, show you the first the periodic analog of Bilo's theorem. Uh, so Bilou's theorem was the fact that the distribution of points of small bell height in the complex projective line uh, was related to the integration measure on the circle. I'd say, that, I'd say that for, at least if you look at roots of unity, that uh, they could distribute to the integral of the circle, but it's the same for any sequence of points whose height is <coughs> zero. So let's consider a sequence of distinct points in P1 of Q bar whose veil height go to zero. And then the sequence mu xn of measures on the analytic space attached to by Berkovich, let's say at the place P, converges to the Dirac measure at the Gauss point. So it means the analog of Bilou's theorem, there is a convergence theorem, but the limit measure is a Dirac measure at this new point. So that's why one had to introduce them. So uh, in general, well, there is a similar uh, uh, the, there is a periodic full a periodic equidistribution theorem, and uh, to describe it, I have to show you how to define measures. Sorry, Bilou theorem is equidistribution of points small heights on the projective line uh, when the height is uh, the veil height. This is a dynamical system x one x two. So now, how will you define a measure on a Berkovich space? At first sight, it might appear complicated because on the complex case, we had uh, functions, we could deriv derivate them, and so on. And now we can't. <laughs> so uh, I first show you what it happens when the variety and the line bundle and the metric on the line bundle is elementary in the sense that I have embedded the, line, the variety in the projective space. The line model is just the O of one and the metric is just the usual veil metric given by the embedding. So now what, what can I do is take the Zariski closure of the variety X into the projective space of other integers. I get an integral model of the variety X. Well, I will assume for simplicity that this model is normal, but it's not a serious assumption. And uh, I will look at the special fiber of this model. 
Okay? So the special fiber, in general, might have many irreducible components, and they, have, they may have some multiplicities, xj and mg. And one fact, which is implied by the fact that uh, x curly x is assumed to be normal, is that uh, the xj is a reduction of that there is on the Berkovich space a canonical point, which I call cj, which, in some sense, reduces to the generic point of the variety xj. So it happens so. Uh, if I have uh, a point in, the, in some affinoid algebra, say, so uh, some norm, uh, nu to r plus, I can look at the kernel of nu. Uh, blah, 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 blah. No. What can I have? So I have a, a subalgebra which is given by, uh, so A is a quotient of the algebra of power series. So I can take the algebra, uh, maybe the quotient of the algebra with integral coefficients, say. Not exactly like that. And uh, this algebra itself has a quotient which is a finite type sp bar algebra. And to, uh, the map to the norm new corresponds its kernel, which is a prime ideal in the algebra A, and then I can intersect it in A naught and uh, look at what it happens at the level of A, a mod A naught mod A naught naught, and I get a prime ideal here. So I get a point in some algebraic variety. So this is roughly the description of a reduction map from a back of its space to some uh, algebraic variety, which is a reduction in some sense of the space. And uh, the variety xj, in that sense, is a reduction of a single point, psi j. So now, I moreover compute the degree of the special fiber, or of the component xj of the special fiber. And the measure is, on the analytic space, is simply defined as the sum over all components of the Dirac measure at the point psi j, multiplied by the multiplicity and the degree. Okay, so these measures are discrete, but their support is contained in the set of new points. These points, xi j, do have nothing to see with the classical points. So they are really new, new points. And uh, this definition uh, is inspired, well, I was inspired uh, by a paper by Camille, who was trying to do a record of geometry in a periodic context. And he used measures, but he only introduced a uh, uh, not sigma additive measures, but finitely additive measures, and the, the, the um, what's the name? So the Boolean algebra on which uh, this measure, this finitely additive uh, measure took place was a set of all affinoids. So when you have an affinoid, you have such points and in some sense, his measures can be viewed on the Berkovich space as linear combinations of Dirac measures. And that's why he couldn't uh, use, uh, he could only have finitely, finite additivity because he could not sum indefinitely Dirac sums. <coughs> so I give two examples. The first one, one example, if you look at the veil height, so the veil height is just given by the standard embedding of P1 in P1. <laughs> So what is the risk closure? It's just P1, you don't do anything. And the special fiber is just P1 over FP bar. And the degree of the line model of one is one. And the point, the point uh, xi which will respond to the special fiber is exactly the Gauss point. So the measure you get is exactly the direct measure at the Gauss point. And if you look at uh, polarized dynamical systems, then you will get in a similar way as in the, a measure on the space which is similar to, to what happens. So uh, now uh, this works for elementary metrics, but if you want integrable metrics, any metrics, then you have to go through the limit process that I described and verify that 
you take uh, elementary metrics converging to your metric, and that, you know, yes? Just take the value of the tension at the point. Right. No, if you, if you have a space and a point x on the space, then you want to integrate uh, Dirac measure of at x against the function phi, which is continuous, and it's just phi of x. You're, you're talking about continuous function. You're talking about continuous functions in, the, in measure theory. You're integrating its real valued functions. So they have nothing to do with, uh, with uh, data, data, data algebras. Okay? So you have to trace the limit process and check that if you go through this process, this discrete measure converge to something, which does not depend of, on any choice. And this, again, is uh, will, uh, the, the, what makes the thing work. It's really positivity that uh, one can find anywhere, anywhere. So in that way, I have measure C1 of L bar to the maximal power on this Berkovich analytic spaces. And the properties of these measures are pretty much the same as in the complex case. I mean, the total mass of this measure is the degree of the variety. If the, the line model is the metric, the, the line model has a semi-positive metric which means that it's uniform limit of elementary ones, then the measure is positive because it's a limit of positive measures. There is a symmetric multilinear extension. I mean, if I take, a, I can take products of various uh, line models in number equal to the dimension of the variety and I will get measures. And there is a compatibility with morphisms and products, which is a bit complicated because the product of two Berkovich spaces attached to two varieties is not the space of Berkovich attached to the product, but there are maps and so on. So, I'm stressed. so one remark is that I have defined this maximal power of C1 of L bar to the N, which is a measure, and I have no idea at all how to define just the single C1 of L bar. I mean, I can define measures, but not currents. And so, uh, with all these definitions that I have shown you, what happens is that all uh, the variational principle and so on goes exactly through in the periodic context. So one just needed to understand these measures, how to, to make them live, and then all, all the machinery from our kind of geometry goes through. And so, in that way, one gets a following distribution theorem for, let's say, polarized dynamical systems over periodic fields. If you take such a polarized dynamical system and the sequence of points going to zero, and uh, you assume that any subvariety contains only finitely many points, then the discrete measures delta of pk converge to the measure mu f. Yes, but I'm saying that. Yes, but uh, it was uh, the third point. It's multilinear. You can extend it. Without knowing, what uh, Without knowing it, but just uh, by polarizing. Uh, <laughs> so there is, uh, at least, there is this essentially verbatim that I, I could discuss one minute. In the complex equidistribution theorem, I uh, had taken some function phi, a test function, to know the limit of the measure, and usually the test function was C, infin uh, C infinity function. So on the Berkovich spaces, I have no C infinity function. So what I need to have is enough functions so, so that I can, uh, evaluating the, by testing the, the measures on them is enough. I mean, that this means dense subset of function. And this uh, dense subset of function is uh, given, let's say, by a uh, integrable matrix on the trivial line model. <laughs> I say, uh, yeah. uh, let me say like that. I can, if I write the trivial line model as a difference of two line models, two times, two, twice the same, line model minus this felt, but I, put, I end, uh, uh, endow the two line models with different semi-positive matrix, 
then I get a metric on the trivial line model, then the norm of one is some function, which will be continuous by the, all the definitions, but not any continuous functions can be achieved that way. But these functions, nevertheless, are dense in the sets of all continuous functions, and this is an application of the Stone-Virus class theorem on, on the Berkowitz space, in the theorem, a theorem of Gubler that such functions are dense. So, so in that way, I get a dense set of functions which is related to Arakelov geometry, and all, so the process can really go through, and so one gets the proof of such a theorem. Gubler, Walter Gubler. He wrote uh, two papers on uh, local heights uh, of varieties, uh, one in color and one in uh, um, something, some confondu, uh, Padova or something like that, or, or Pisa maybe, I don't know. Uh, I don't remember. So, and he introduced also, so in some part of his work, there are Berkovich spaces entering the picture. So he proved the, the density theorem which is required. So uh, I stop here. Thank you very much for your <laughs> question.